in section 8.1 talking about sequences. So our first definition is what is a sequence? So a sequence is a list of numbers written in a definite order. So for instance, you're going to have a first term, which will denote A1, a second term, which will denote A2, a third term, and so forth, all the way up to some nth term, and even beyond that, so with an n plus 1 term, an n plus 2 term, and so forth. Typically for notation, you'll see these written in a bracket or a set notation. Uh, you may also see this denoted as the sequence an, and an could be defined as some type of formula or by some type of formula. Sometimes they will put your subscript saying that sequence started at 1, the first term, all the way up to the infinite terms. So our first example is really just to get used to how can I take a formula for a sequence and expand it and write out what does this sequence look like as a list. So find the first four elements of the sequence n plus 1 divided by 2n minus 1. So what we want to do is we want to start with our first term. So I'll denote this is when n is going to be equal to 1. And I'm just letting everywhere we see in this formula you have an n now be replaced with 1. So for instance, I would have 1 plus 1 divided by 2 times 1 minus 1. So in my numerator, I have 2. In my denominator, I have 2 minus 1, so 1, meaning my first term is a 2. I'm going to do this to find our second term. So what does this look like when n is equal to 2? Well, in my numerator, I would have 2 plus 1 divided by, in our denominator, 2 times 2 minus 1. So in our numerator, I have 3. In our denominator, I have 4 minus 1, which is also 3, meaning our second term is a 1. They asked me for the first four terms, so that means I'm going to have to find what is the term when n is equal to 3, and also what is the term when n is equal to 4. When n is equal to 3, notice in the numerator, I would have 3 plus 1. In the denominator, I would have 2 times 3 minus 1. So numerator of 4, denominator would be 6 minus 1, which is 5. So our third term is just the fraction 4 fifths. For our fourth term, plugging in that n is equal to 4, I would have 4 plus 1 divided by 2 times 4 minus 1. So in our numerator, I have 5. In our denominator, I have 8 minus 1, which is 7. So our fourth term is 5 7. If we want to put this in our bracket notation, write these as a list. Obviously, there are more terms in the sequence, so I put my dot, dot, dots. This is what it looks like to expand a sequence from a formula. All right. Example 2 is going in the opposite direction. So now they want me to find the formula for the nth term of this expanded sequence. So the sequence they give me is 1 negative 1 eighth, positive 1 27, negative 1 64th, and positive 1 1 25th. So I always like to think about these as what's happening in the numerator and the denominator. So I think if we just consider the numerator, then you would notice that you're going from a positive 1 to a negative 1, a positive 1 to a negative 1, and so forth. So the numerator in my formula needs to be something that will generate positive, then negative, positive, then negative. So let's talk about our formula. Well, one nice, easy way to generate a positive value, then a negative value, and so forth, there are quite a few, but a nice, easy one is have to have negative 1 raised to a power. So let's think about this. If I were to raise negative 1 to the n power, and I were to consider our first term. So when n is equal to 1, notice this would be negative 1 to the first power. It would be giving me a negative value, but I want my first term to be positive. So you have a couple of options. One way to do that is to write this as the n plus 1 power. Now you'll notice negative 1 to the 1 plus 1 would give me negative 1 squared, that positive 1 for the first term. You could have also written this as an n minus 1. Let's look at what's happening in the denominator. 
Well, for my first term, our denominator is 1, right? Because this is 1 over 1. I then have an 8, a 27, a 64, and a 125. So again, keep in mind, this was my first term, my second term, my third term. And the idea here is that I want to relate these values to the end that they go with. So how is 1 related to 1? Well, there's quite a few ways you could talk about that relationship. I want to know how is 8 related to 2? There are a couple ways for that. You could be thinking about multiplying values to get 8 at this point. But when I start considering how is 3 related to 27, 4 related to 64, and so forth, noticing that I want this relationship between each one to have that same relationship. Well, I think it's easy to see that when I cube 2, I get 8. When I cube 3, I get 27. When I cube 4, I get 64. When I cube 5, I get 125. And it does work for that first term as well. When I cube 1, I get 1. So this is just the nth term, meaning that nth value cubed. So this is the formula that I'm proposing for this sequence. Now it is a good idea to check and make sure that you have done this correctly. So if we wanted to expand this, I won't do it for all five of them. But again, notice when I plug in that n is 1, I would have negative 1 to the 1 plus 1 over 1 cubed. I am in fact getting 1. When I use n is 2, I would have a negative 1 to the 2 plus 1, meaning negative 1 cubed, which is giving me a negative, and the denominator 2 cubed, which would be that 8. So I have negative 1 8. You can continue to check this and see that our formula does in fact generate this sequence. Now we want to talk a little bit about what does it mean to have the limit of a sequence. So your textbook defines this in this way. A sequence a n has the limit l if we can make the terms of the sequence a n as close to the limit L as we like by taking N sufficiently large. So basically by taking N large, I can have the sequence approach a particular value. That value is the limit of the sequence. Notation for that, limit as N goes to infinity of the sequence A N is equal to L. If I can get this single value L that the sequence is approaching as N goes to infinity, I say the sequence converges. Otherwise, I say the sequence diverges. So examples of when something may diverge, maybe I'm taking the limit as n goes to infinity, and I realize my sequence is going towards infinity. Maybe I realize that the sequence is approaching negative infinity. Maybe as n goes to infinity, my sequence is oscillating between the positive and the negative of some constant. Obviously, I don't mean zero, because that would be a single value. I mean. I have, say, a positive one and a negative one that it's going back and forth between. It's not approaching a single value, so it diverges. Yeah. We're going to look at a few examples of taking the limit of a sequence, but I do want to remind you that you worked a good bit with limits back in Calculus 1. You should be familiar with limit laws. Your text repeats those for sequences. So limit laws for sequences. I believe this is on page 429 of your text, but it's the same limit laws you had for functions back in Calc 1, but now for sequences. Remember also back in Calc 1 we worked a good bit with L'Hopital's rule. So if I'm taking the limit of a quotient and I get an indeterminate form, so I get something like 0 over 0, infinity over infinity, and so forth, then L'Hopital's rule says the limit of the quotient is equal to the limit of the quotient of their derivatives. Remember, we took the derivative of the numerator, the derivative of the denominator, looked at that limit, and we, Lobatov's rule says those limits are the same. Now, also when we were working back then, we learned a few quick tricks for how to find the limit of functions, and I'm going to be using some of those techniques today as well. So this should be a little bit of a review from limits in Calc 1, but applied to sequences. So example three. I want to find the limit of the sequence if it converges. Otherwise, I'm going to say that it diverges. So in part A, my sequence is 3n plus 2 divided by 4n plus 5. 
So remember one of the techniques back in that Lobatol section from Calc 1 is that when I have n's in my sequence, back then it was a function of x's, the trick is that you divide by the highest power of n you see in the denominator. So in this example, the highest power of n I see in my denominator is 1. So I'm going to divide every single term by n to the first power, meaning I'm looking at 3n over n plus 2 over n divided by 4n over n plus 5 over n. You should notice in my first piece the n's cancel, so I have 3 plus 2 over n. In the denominator, again, n's cancel in that first piece, so I have 4 plus 5 over n. If I'm wanting to take the limit as n goes to infinity of this sequence, then you should notice as n goes to infinity, this piece is going to go to zero. As the denominator gets larger and larger, the fraction is getting smaller and smaller and approaching zero. The same thing for this 5 over n. As that denominator gets larger and larger, headed towards infinity, the fraction as a whole is going towards zero. So what you're left with, the limit of 3 as n goes to infinity is just 3 plus 0, divided by the limit of 4 is just 4 plus 0. So we would say that this converges to 3 fourths. And this technique is perfectly fine. I do want to remind you the reason this is legitimate. It is like I have taken the original expression and I have multiplied it by 1 over n divided by 1 over n. Ultimately, what did we do? I multiplied that expression by 1, which is why I did not change the values, meaning I did have that equality. Okay, but you don't have to write this out every time. You can just use the technique. In part B, I now have 3n squared plus 2 divided by 4n plus 5. Again, if I'm wanting to take the limit of the sequence, so the limit as n goes to infinity of 3n squared plus 2 over 4n plus 5, I'm going to look at the denominator, and the highest power of n I see again is 1. So I'm going to take each term and divide it by n to the first power. So I have the limit as n goes to infinity of, this would be 3n squared over n plus 2 over n divided by 4n over n plus 5 over n. So what I'm looking at is the limit as n goes to infinity. Here you have one of the n's canceling, meaning I'm left with a 3n plus 2 over n divided by n's are canceling, so I have 4 plus 5 over n. Now, let's look what happens as n goes to infinity. For this first piece, you're going to have 3 times an n going towards infinity. Notice that's still going towards infinity. Here I have a plus 2 over n. Again, as the denominator goes to infinity, the fraction goes to 0. Divided by 4 plus, here I have 5 over something going towards infinity. So again, this little fraction is going towards 0 you're looking at something very, very large divided by 4. We are still looking at something very, very large. So in this case, we say that that sequence diverges. Part C. Now I have the sequence 3n plus 2. It's divided by 4n squared plus 5. I'm going to use the same technique. I'm interested in the limit as n goes to infinity of the sequence. And the technique is that I look at the denominator and I look for the highest power of n. That power is 2, so I'm going to take every single term here and divide it by n squared. So what I have is the limit as n goes to infinity of 3n over n squared plus 2 over n squared divided by 4n squared over n squared plus 5 over n squared. In my first term, notice my n's cancel, but I have 1 left in the denominator, so that is 3 over n, plus 2 over n squared, divided by n squares cancel, so I have 4 plus 5 over n squared. And I still need to be writing my limit as n goes to infinity of this sequence. 
as n goes to infinity in my first piece, that fraction is going to go to 0. This fraction is going to 0. 4 will stay 4. And this fraction will also go to 0 as n goes to infinity. So what you're looking at is 0 plus 0 over 4 plus 0. We would say that this sequence converges to 0. Now I have the sequence 3 plus negative 1 to the n divided by 3. Now the techniques I've used in A, B, and C are not going to apply here because you'll notice I don't have some power of n in my denominator. So a couple of different ways we can work with this. First thing I'll note is that I am considering the limit as n goes to infinity of this expression. Well, I think it's pretty clear to see that the 3 on the top and the 3 on the denominator are not affected by n. So this is the same thing as 3 plus the limit as n goes to infinity of negative 1 to the n divided by 3. Let's talk about this part of the expression. So what is happening as I raise negative 1 to larger and larger values? Well, you should notice that it's still going to be oscillating between the negative and the positive depending on whether or not n is an even or an odd power. So this part of the expression is going, say, negative 1, 1, negative 1, 1, and so forth. So if we wanted to consider what's really happening to this expression, when this piece is going to negative 1, you have 3 minus 1, which is 2 over 3. Or, if we're on one of the powers that are even, negative 1 to an even power is generating our positive 1. When I add that to 3, I have 4 being divided by 3. So this sequence is oscillating between 2 thirds and 4 thirds. It is never approaching one value, meaning this also diverges. 